Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sports Page. I am Ashton. Sitting here with me today, we have a special guest. He is the host of our newest show here on the Peak One Sports Network. It's Bo Stewart, and his show is Talking BS with Bo. What's going on? What's going on, man? How are you? I'm doing great, especially after this great Cowboys news that broke right before we came on. Uh, we were all perfect yeah, timing. We were all talking about DeAndre Hopkins. What could we do to get him? Um, and then another wide receiver sort of fell into our laps. One we were working on last year, uh, Brandon Cook, who I think is is a great number two receiver for this team especially since they only give it, uh, gave up a fifth and a sixth round pick. Oh, yeah. Uh, basically, sixth round pick is a comp pick, most likely. Fifth, we can do with that. Fifth round picks sometimes mesh, sometimes they don't. Um, I think last season the Texans were asking for a second and maybe a replacement during the trade deadline, but obviously they couldn't move them. I'm more excited for it because DeAndre Hopkins contract, I think Cooks is a little bit cheaper. And I heard that Hopkins wanted to rework his contract. So if the Cowboys are trying to save money to extend Dak and you got contracts with, you know, CeeDee Lamb and Trayvon Diggs coming up, yeah. then I think that's huge. Yeah. Going into this off season, uh, I think one of the uh, two biggest holes on this team that they were looking at to fix in the draft was cornerback and wide receiver. And they didn't, I mean, technically they haven't done anything big in free agency, but they make trades for, uh, uh, Brandon cook. I was going to say Deandre Hopkins. They fill the cornerback position and who knows, maybe, maybe they can get B. John Robinson in the draft and just really solidify this offense. If he falls far enough before I was, okay with getting Bijan if he was going to fall to 26 but uh now that you have a great receiving core now cd lamb brandon cook and michael gallup i think is a great number three i just i just don't think he was that great at, as a number two receiver um when you had uh, amari cooper when he would show up uh in games he i think you had the best receiving core in the league problem with amari cooper especially on the road is sometimes he'd have one, two catches a game and that's it. But now CD lamb prove uh, it's proven last year that he is absolutely a number one receiver and uh, man, the offensive line I think is good. Uh, we'll see how Tyler, uh, Tyler Smith improves in his second season. And if Dak can just control the turnovers, I think you have a top five offense and a top five defense going into next year. Yeah, um, I think left guard is still a position I think they'll look for in the draft. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe tight end. I mean, we still haven't heard anything from Dalton Schultz. I mean, he hasn't been picked up. Maybe he might come back to Dallas on a, a lower contract too because I don't think he was looking – he's getting the contract that he was thinking he was going to get. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think Dalton Schultz would be, he's a great safety blanket for Dak, but you saw with a couple of rookie uh, tight ends last year that maybe we don't, <laughs> don't need that because he, Dak was able to distribute around, especially when Dalton was out. Uh, don't get me wrong. Dalton, Dalton was, Dalton Schultz was a, a lot better, caught a lot more touchdowns, a lot more passes than these other guys. Uh, of course. But he, he looked absolutely replaceable where you could, draft another guy um oh yeah especially if i mean obviously at least i think it's obvious they need to get another running back in um zeke didn't have a whole lot of production last year uh but i i don't know that tony pollard's the guy i think tony pollard's a good change of pace back and uh I, that's like i said i think Bijan robinson would be perfect uh in in my draft scenarios i have him going a lot earlier than 26 uh and i know some other people say that they have bigger needs than running back right now if they believe that tony pollard's the guy i, I don't know if you run tony pollard's your starter for 17 games and 20 carries a game if he's gonna last uh zeke was a big guy and he could take a beating and he was even good uh 
in the past game blocking this past year. So uh, I think that's depending on how the offensive line can, can sustain what they possibly had last year is is an above average offensive line, especially with Terrence Steele coming back. Uh, I think running back might be your biggest hole, which is is a good thing. Looking at what this team look this team's offense looks like going into next year. Yes, uh, I still think offensive line is huge. Um, Tyron Smith is on the back nine of his career. I don't think he's played a full season in the last four or five seasons. Um, Tyler Smith. Is he gonna stay? Is he gonna go back to guard, or is he gonna stay at tackle? I think he played well at tackle. I mean, well enough that Tyron Smith moved to right tackle towards the end of the season. But now we have Terrence Steele coming back on the right side. I mean, our really only position of need is left guard. Yeah. Um, depending on, I mean, I assume Terrence Steele is going to say stay at right guard. Uh, I don't think you want to move him around. And make, I mean, excuse me, right tackle. I don't think you want to make tackle, him move around yeah. uh, to guard. And I I know Tyron Smith looked off at right guard. I think that was more if he had missed all season. He was kind of getting back into the groove of things. So assuming he's healthy, I think you have to put him at left tackle because, I, I, again, I don't know how he looks at left guard. And you know that Tyler Smith, at least can play left guard. He's played, he played left guard a little bit last year, last season. And this team thought he was going to play left guard um, before Tyron Smith got hurt. Yeah, exactly. So I think you at least go into it thinking Tyron Smith at left guard, uh, left tackle Tyler Smith at left guard. But then again, how many games does Tyron Smith play? I think it, that's always, I think the thing, uh, assuming he doesn't have a ridiculous injury where he has meat literally falling off his bone eight to 10 games. And that might be, you know, I think you have a a kind of a a DeGrom situation here. It's like, if you can have half the season, I I think you count that as win at least Tyron Smith at Tyron Smith level. Yeah. And, uh, we saw Biotish at center. He played tremendous this year. I mean, he made the Pro Bowl. Uh, like I said, I think first round, the Cowboys are probably going to go offensive line as yeah. a need. I mean, with this with a big trade with Brandon Cooks and Gilmore. Gilmore's, you know, he's 32. You know, he's obviously he's not the defensive player of the year that he once was in New England no. or anything like that. But he had a productive season, and he played well. I think, I mean, obviously, Gilmore has a lot of upside, uh, low risk, uh, high reward situation. It's a definite upgrade. Even if he disappoints a little bit, I think he's an upgrade from Anthony Brown. I'm excited to see him on one side and Diggs on the other. He is, as of right now, I think, I mean, you're looking at him as your starter, as a starter. Now, depending on what happens in training camp, and, you know, uh, maybe he disappoints. But I don't think you're going into this draft thinking about taking a cornerback in the first round. I think with the Brandon Cook situation, I don't think you're going to look at wide receiver in the first round. Uh, depending on who's available, I don't know. Uh, if a player drops, I mean, sometimes you just have to go with the best available player. Um, and most mock drafts had the Cowboys taking a corner or a receiver. So it's going to be interesting now leading up to the draft next, next month to see who they have, because take out taco Charlton. I think the past 10 years, the Cowboys have done a fantastic job in the first round drafting players. Yeah, a lot so- of, a lot of boring picks, a lot of offense alignment, a lot of picks that, fan base wasn't happy about whatsoever some really exciting with micah parsons which a lot of people weren't that happy about micah because you there were a couple other corners you wanted to get that that didn't fall to you so you ended up looking into micah parsons um i think cd lamb was was a fun pick but then when you anytime you draft offensive line in the first round nobody's going to be excited about it uh i know people were not happy about tyler smith last year but it's going to be interesting because I think the Cowboys are in a position where they can take best available player 
because there's not a gaping hole on their team. Now you can say there's weaknesses. Uh, I still think their secondary is a weakness. Maybe their interior defensive line, uh, like you said, offensive line. I think running backs a question, but they've fil- filled arguably their two biggest holes this off season with without giving a whole giving up a whole lot. They didn't get, uh, trade a first or second round pick. Uh, they didn't take on big contracts. I I think um, outside of obviously they didn't sign any big free agents, but I think this off season you have to count as a win for the Cowboys because going into next season, they're better than they were this past season from a roster talent standpoint. Yeah. And I think they're going to be a lot better, you know, financially because like I said, the extensions of contracts, they said they're trying to re- rework an extension with Dak. I think yeah. Dak's contracts up next season. I think the, the current extension so, they have him on, um, he's pretty much going to be the quarterback for the next three years. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know what Dak haters want to think, or they don't think he's the guy. I mean, I'm not going to argue with you there. I don't think he's an elite quarterback, but I think he's good enough if you put enough talent around him. Uh, and that's the argument where he gets paid too much. Okay. You argue what you want, but there's nothing the Cowboys can do right now. He's your quarterback for the next three years, because if you cut him or trade him, you have 30, $40 million in dead cap space. So there's no point. You might as well run with him. Um, Cause even if you draft a rookie quarterback, you're not going to be able to benefit from his rookie deal because you're going to be messing with Dak's contract. That's why the Cowboys really couldn't benefit from Dak's rookie deal because they had Romo's contract on for a couple of years. So Dak hater or not, he's your quarterback for the next three years. He has to be, unless you can find some ridiculous trade where the other team will take on his whole contract and that's not going to happen. Um, no, you see that with Lamar. Exactly. So uh, I think, I mean, the Cowboys may keep extending him and restructuring his contract every year. I think they've done what they're going to do this year um, to open up a little bit of space. But right now the Cowboys are in about a two, maybe three year window anyway, because you have to re-sign CD Lamb. You have to uh, re-sign Micah Parsons, depending on how quickly they want to do that. Obviously with Zeke, he wanted to do it after a second year. and We saw how that turned out. Um, and I think we're probably all in agreement, at least with Micah Parsons is I don't care, do what it takes, pay him whatever, yeah. whatever it takes. Cause we want to keep Micah, uh, CD lamb. I, I, I don't want to overpay him, but definitely do what you can. Cause we saw when we lost as Bryant, when we lost Amari Cooper, what happens to this team when you don't have a solid number one and number two receiver. So now that we have. CD Lamb, Brandon Cook, uh, we'll see how he does, but I think he's going to be a great number two receiver. And then Michael Gallup, who has shown he's not he's not the guy at number two, but he's a good number three receiver. I think we want to keep that uh, intact as long as we can. Um, and who knows, maybe you can mess around with Dak's contract. I know they already uh, restructured Tyron Smith's, Demarcus Lawrence's contract to open up some space like you had mentioned to earlier, because you have to re-sign CD lamb and uh, Micah Parsons. You have to have cap space open for that. But uh, right now they're definitely going all in, not quite to the level that the Los Angeles Rams were going because they're not giving up a bunch of assets, which I think is great. You have a lot of these uh, players they're going after trading late, late draft picks for that. Who knows? Maybe they don't work out because they're they're a little bit older, but they have the talent and they're exciting moves to see. And if they don't work out, they don't work out. You didn't give up anything big for him. You can't say the Cowboys didn't try. Yeah, the way I look at it with the Brandon Cooks trade is like we gave up a uh, this year's fifth and next year's sixth. Basically, sixth round pick is traded Amari Cooper away for. Yeah, so. I mean, the sixth round pick is probably going to be a comp pick because Connor McGovern got signed by Buffalo, so that's a wash. What what receivers can we see in the draft in the fifth round that could, you know, be you know, exactly. a a Robin to CD Lamb? You can't. There's not. You're not going to see anybody like that. Um, 
most of the receivers that I thought Dallas might be interested in, they're going to be long gone before the fifth round pick comes around. So, you yeah, know, the Zay talking, Flowers and the Johnsons. Yeah, exactly. And when you're talking number two receivers or uh, rookie running backs to to pair with Tony Pollard, those aren't very difficult to find in general in most drafts, second, third, fourth round picks. But you might be, I mean, you might be able to find a receiver in the first or second round. Maybe if you look out, uh, that can give you the production Brandon Cook can. I mean, he hasn't had a quarterback in a couple of years. He is up there in age. He wanted to be traded here last year, and uh, it just didn't work out. But you're not going to find somebody who day one is going to be what Brandon Cook is now. Um, which is, you know, why I'm saying this is this is an interesting, I, I wouldn't quite say exciting, but interesting year for the Cowboys on what they, because I think this is the first year where you're not saying, okay, they have to draft this position in the first round. It's, let's see who drops to you. I, w- I mean, if they can find, you know, if they have a receiver that drops to them, that would maybe a, a mid-round pick was projected to be a mid-round pick. Who knows? I I don't think there's a position where you could be mad at the Cowboys right now for drafting if, uh, if they just pick best player available. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, comment here down below if you think uh, that Bo and I are wrong on this, but I, I just don't see the huge gaping hole that we thought of at the end of last year and 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 cowboys haters i mean dak haters don't say quarterback is a big gaping hole that's please that's no not, uh, i'm not a huge dak fan but he is a capable definitely good enough to win a super bowl quarterback if you have a great team around him and i think the cowboys uh, looking at their talent last year you didn't lose a whole lot of it uh if you can just do what you did on defense last year at least in the early part uh, be a top five defense that you know that you are and maybe uh, the offense is going to look totally different now that you don't have Kellen Moore that may be good that may be bad but uh, Dak has has some weapons now and we'll see how he uses them if he can if he can control the turnovers I think this is a this is going to be a good year for the Cowboys yeah a lot of his I feel like a lot of Dak's turnovers were basically just trying to make something happen yeah. And looking for the big play. I mean, Dak in previous years, he I mean, he threw down the field more this year than he did the previous years. He was always like, you know, oh, check down, check down. That's all they said. And, I mean, I think when you get Dak a little bit out of the pocket, he's a lot more comfortable. And so I think if, you know, Mike McCarthy can, you know, kind of help him with the read option or something like that or get him – rolling out a little bit more, I think the turnovers will see decreased. Yeah, let's let's not mistake anything. Um, Dak is not Tom Brady. He's not Aaron Rodgers. Uh, I think most of his career on, on the best, when he's playing at his best, he's a seventh, eighth best quarterback in the league. Uh, even last year at his worst, even with all the turnovers, he's still a top half quarterback he's an above average quarterback um, and you can say some of those turnovers weren't on him which is true but he did turn it over and I think that was he was taking more risks throwing it downfield more um, and injury situations he's still you know uh, dealing with some nagging injuries which hopefully he's going to be over this year uh, but we're not saying that Dak has to be Tom Brady or take over. he has the ability to take over a game like we saw against Tampa Bay in the wild card round. He has that ability, but you don't want him to be that quarterback that carries the team all year. You want him to have three really good receivers, a good one, two, and three, which he has now. You want him to have a good running game, which we'll see if if they can uh, sign another running back, draft another running back. And you want him to have a decent offensive line, which I think the offensive line is capable. Let's see what happens with injuries. Let's see. If there's one of those second year snags uh, or sophomore year snags that a lot of rookies face going into their second year after performing really well. Um, And then I don't think many people are worried about the defense because you bring back all your great weapons plus, uh, plus add a couple. 
I think, you know, we're not asking Dak, at least we're not on this show asking Dak to be Patrick Mahomes. We're just saying, hey, be an above average quarterback and don't turn the ball over. That's all you need. Now, again, the argument is, hey, he makes 40 something odd million dollars a year. Okay. But I I don't I don't want to have that argument because there's nothing. I don't have arguments based on uh, things that can't change. We can have arguments on who they should trade for, who should they draft, who should they sign, things that are possible, fun things. But there's no way out of this stat contract uh, for the next two or three years. So uh, we're talking about now and the next few years and, and what Super Bowl window they have. And Dak's your quarterback. Unless they get hurt. Unless he gets hurt and then Cooper Rush is your quarterback. But uh, you're paying Dak for a couple of years. Yeah, definitely. I really think you're stuck with Dak. I mean, I've, I've always been a big supporter of Dak. So I'm uh, with that. I'm with keeping Dak. Yeah. And moving on, I know we talk about, we talk more Cowboys than we planned on just because of that trade. I think it's uh, uh, an exciting Exciting move, even though the Cowboys still haven't done anything in free agency. Uh, I'm okay with right now. Um, maybe they can make a couple of moves, but moving around the NFL, what are some of the uh, big key free agent moves that other teams have made? And what are some players that are still out there for other teams to sign? Oh, uh, well, I mean, there's still the question of Lamar Jackson. I think Baltimore is going to. Lamar Jackson, he really doesn't have much else to do but sit out the season and demand more money. It looks like Oakland's going with Garoppolo. Uh, so I thought Lamar was going to, and, you know, Tampa Bay going with Baker Mayfield. So it looks like he's going to be a bridge guy for either Kyle Trask or they draft somebody. I mean, it's pretty obvious Carolina is going quarterback. You wouldn't make that kind of trade with Chicago if you weren't going to go quarterback. Yeah. So it's it's now. I really think, you know, I kind of think the NFL is kind of – and the agents are kind of like conspiring against Lamar because I feel like since he's not – he doesn't have an agent, I feel like, – and all these teams all of a sudden don't need a quarterback. So you mean to tell me Washington doesn't need a quarterback? Yeah. So it's just weird how these reports are like, oh, we don't need Lamar. We don't want Lamar. We don't want him. And I thought that was it just weird. doesn't make I mean, much why sense. Are teams coming out and say they don't want <laughs> Lamar. Like, if if you're not interested, they don't say anything. Um, I know there's a lot of you know when you have rumors uh, tying a player to a team, uh, it's fine for a team to say, yeah, we're not we're not that interested. Just kind of squash the rumors. But yeah, clearly something's going on with five. When I think it was five teams all at the same time come out and say we're not going to negotiate which is fine, but you're just kind of showing that there's some sort of collusion going on that just five random teams decide all at the same time to, to say we're not interested. Um, and it's, I mean, I'm not going to blame any team for not being interested because it's not a real advantageous position to be in because, uh, if you offer Lamar a contract, he has, I can't remember the five or 10 days or something in there he has that long to decide and you're kind of, and, and you're locked in. You can't do anything at quarterback then because whatever you offer him, um, you, that, that goes against your cap if he signs. So you have to wait to see what he decides to do. Uh, now that most of the better quarterbacks are off the market here, Garoppolo car, uh, even Baker Mayfield, Maybe it's it's better now to try to sign because I mean if you haven't signed your quarterback now you you probably aren't this off season you're gonna draft or wait till next off season. Um, but I think I mean it's obviously a disadvantage for Lamar not to have an agent, even though his mom could think she's good enough to negotiate, which may be true. Uh, I. I still think it'd be better to have an agent and you would probably make a little more money on your contract or a little guaranteed more money than you would not having it. And that's, you know, and it doesn't matter if you, if you have to pay the agent, but agents have relationships with teams. Exactly. Uh, Lamar Jackson's mom just can't go 
into any owner's office. I mean, I know the Cowboys aren't interested, but just for the, the sake of argument, she doesn't have a relationship with Jerry Jones. Most big time agents have some player on most teams to be able to uh, go in and talk to them. And a lot of times uh, it, it's a little different because Lamar Jackson's a top quarterback, a top 10 quarterback easily, an MVP. When you're talking about mid-level players, a lot of times they get workouts, they get negotiations rolling just because their agent has a good relationship with that team or he has a client that already plays on that team or something like that. I I find it unbelievable how Lamar's not at least getting something um, rumored. Like he may be talking to people, I, I talking teams, I'm not sure. All we hear is what teams want want to put out there. Um, So he could be absolutely negotiating with somebody, but they're not going to, I mean, obviously for negotiating reasons, you don't want to put that out there. But honestly, I think he's on the Ravens next year. Now, whether he decides to hold out or or whatever, that's on him. But uh, I don't think Baltimore had any, any idea what they were doing. I don't, or I don't think they had the thought that they were going to lose him. They just didn't want to deal with his mother. They didn't like, you know, whether it's on her or not, they didn't want to negotiate. They said she wasn't cooperating. You know, who, who the hell knows what that really means. Um, but they said, you know what, just go out there, see what, what kind of contract you can get. We don't even have to negotiate. Let's let another team do it. Let them do the work. And then, um, when you find out what you're worth, we'll, uh, We'll accept it. Worst case, we don't want to do it, and we get two first round picks. Exactly. So it's that's what's crazy. It's a weird situation because this non exclusive tax uh, or tag isn't anything new. It's just never been used on a player as high profile. I mean, typically it's used on running backs and receivers. It's never been a top ten quarterback that this has been used on. Um. So I don't know. I, I, I'd be very surprised if Lamar Jackson plays for another team this, uh, next year. Yeah. Uh, you got to think Lamar is going to get 200 plus million. But plus you got to give up two first round picks. Yeah. I just don't see any other team to willing to take that risk. Not a team. I mean, I don't have a team in mind, but they would have to be. They would have to be a team that uh, either just lost their quarterback or they have a really good team around them, and that's the piece they're missing. And I don't know if the team fits that model. You said Washington. Washington has a pretty good defense. Um, depending on what they do in the draft, if you add a player like Lamar Jackson, uh, I think they would be a scary team. Now, the issues with their ownership, like maybe they just say, screw it, we'll sign him $50 million a year or something. He's selling the team anyways. Uh But Washington already came out and said they're not interested. But, of course, Cleveland said they weren't interested in Deshaun Watson last year as well. So who who really knows? I mean, we're all playing negotiating games here. Uh, You say you're not interested, and then maybe that that drives interest away. And and now that it appears from the outside that nobody is really interested in signing Lamar Jackson under these conditions – maybe that helps one team out there that that really wants him um, to get him for cheaper because, you know, obviously if there's four or five teams interested, that's just going to drive his number up. Yeah. And you saw the Giants, they signed Daniel Jones, so that didn't help Lamar Jackson's chances either on getting a, a more guaranteed money. Yeah, it didn't help any owners either because – uh all teams have to do now is say, well, well, look at Daniel Jones. He's making $40 million a year. Clearly, Lamar Jackson's better than Daniel Jones, right? And, and I know $40 yeah. million isn't the same as when Dak signed $40 million. The cap's going up. Uh, you're really just talking about what percentage of the cap they take up. Uh, the Giants did have a lot of cap space to use. Uh, and they almost had had to sign him. I, I don't agree. I don't think Daniel Jones is the guy that, that can put them over the top. But when you have a quarterback that's working, you almost have to do it. 
you're saying I'm going to take the risk of being in quarterback purgatory for however long uh, because they're not in a position to draft a quarterback this year. They just went to the divisional round of the playoffs. Um, Unless you just want to tank and go for Caleb Williams next year or something. I don't know. Um, I don't agree with the move, but I understand why they did it. Yeah, and I also forgot to mention about, you know, Derek Carr going to the Saints. So that's another option that Lamar could have, you know, got a trade into. But, yeah, it looks like he's staying in Baltimore for the future. Uh, On the Derek Carr thing, I know I've mentioned it on this show before. I've mentioned it on uh, here on Peak One Sports. We have the lead off on Saturday mornings that I'm on. I've mentioned it. I just think that's a fun a funny situation being a Cowboys fan sitting on the outside that the Raiders wanted to trade Derek Carr to the saints and he, and he had to approve it. Cause he had, I guess he had no trade clause and he said, no, no, we're good. And then he ends up signing with the saints anyways. Uh, I think that's just a funny middle finger right into the Raiders organization who kind of screwed him um, last year anyways, but uh, uh, that's like just it. a little tidbit I like to add on there. Uh, I think it's a, a great signing for the Saints. I mean, why not? You you kind of have a decent team around you. You need a quarterback. Uh, you've been been treading with Andy Dalton and Jameis Winston. I mean, go out there. Unless you're a team like the Texans who have nothing, there's no reason to go after. Honestly, uh, the only quarterbacks they should go after are drafting rookie quarterbacks because you don't need to be spending any cap money on a high profile high profile quarterback that's you're not going to be able to do anything anyway yeah most of the texans speaking of the texans most of the texans you know free agent signings have been one or two year deals so they're in a complete rebuild so i don't see the texans doing anything other than just stacking draft capital and just drafting. So I don't see them being any type of competitive for the next couple of years at least. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a big fan of trading back and getting picks. Uh, unless, I mean, if you want to go ahead and draft a quarterback, uh, of course, I don't run uh, a team. I'm not qualified to run a professional team in anything other than Madden, which, by the way, I do a great job in Madden. Um I'm a big fan of building the team first and then drafting your quarterback and and making a run with a quarterback on a rookie deal. So, uh, honestly, if I were the Texans, and I know everybody in Houston would hate this, uh, just keep drafting back, stacking up picks, build a team for a couple of years, and then go after your quarterback. But, uh, I mean, it doesn't look like – I assume the Panthers are going to take Bryce Young which that could have been the Texans pick if they would have just lost the last game of the season last year. So to screw it up and win. Uh, I think that was the coach because the coach yeah. knew he was out. So he yeah. won on purpose. Yeah, he knew he was done there. Um, I think it was great. But, uh, you know, when you have a top pick like that, you, ha- you have to draft the quarterback because it looks better to draft him and him be a bust than to not draft him and him – have a hall of fame career you know you're just gonna be looked at as a team that that skipped that didn't draft that player well i mean D'Amico ryan's you know he was a great player for the houston texans for years and i think ownership's going to give him a little bit longer of a leash and yeah. most head most new head coaches are going to want to draft their guy so that's what you see like frank wright in Cal- carolina He's going quarterback. I mean, he was with Indianapolis all these years. And after Andrew Luck retired, the Colts, you know, they were just throwing darts at veteran quarterbacks and none of them were able to stick. Yeah. Um, and, and really to, to kind of stay on that topic, uh, of GMs, um, that's why you don't see a lot of GMs trade back for more draft capital unless they're new GMs or they know they have, job security because honestly they could be gone in one to two years you don't want uh, i mean if you're trading a first round pick for uh, a first round pick next year multiple picks the next year all you're doing is getting picks for the next guy that's going to do the job Uh, a lot of times when you see gms kind of at the end of their leash um, 
you'll see them trade a lot of future capital because they don't care anymore. It's not their problem. Um, if this doesn't work out, they're getting fired anyways. If it does work out, then they get to keep their job. Uh, so honestly, that's why, uh, unless there's a team like the Cowboys, which I don't, I don't suggest that be the situation where your owner is the GM as well. Uh, Jerry Jones isn't firing himself or firing his son anyways. Uh, so that's why you don't don't see that a lot. But I think it would be advantageous to teams if, if you just tell the GM, dude, your job's safe. Just just build me a team. Give, give me a five year window. Um, rather than just being the Texans having basically no team around, you just traded away your your number one receiver. Um, and drafting a quarterback who, by the time you might have a team around him to do anything, you're going to have to sign him to a $45, $50 million contract. Or hell, in four years, it might be $55 million. Um, that's what he, he's either a bust or you're paying him $55 million in four years. That's that's pretty yeah. much what you're looking looking at. Yeah, you draft him. You got the four year contract with the fifth year option, or is the three year with the fourth? I mean, uh, in general, it's a four year with four year with a fifth year option. But as you've seen with uh, some players uh, going at wanting an extension after three years and threatening to sit out, uh, now the big thing is unfollowing the team on Instagram. Saying, yeah, that's hey, a huge thing now. Yeah, it's uh, when. Murray got, got his contract and then he just played like absolute crap. I mean, you saw it with Zeke Elliott a couple of years. Uh, I don't know if Zeke would have sat out the season or any real games, but he sat out a couple of weeks in training camp, which we saw the effects of that early on when he was out of shape. Um, ideally, you're looking at, okay, well, four years with a fifth year option, but if Bryce Young balls out, wins rookie of the year, um, does something significant for the Texans, is he the kind of player that after his third year, he says, okay, I want a new contract. I mean, we saw it with, with Dak. Say what you want about Dak, but his first two years were amazing uh, for a rookie quarterback. He, he looked like he was, for a rookie and sophomore quarterback, he looked like he was on the path to possibly throw out Hall of Fame numbers. Now, he obviously didn't, take a very team friendly contract but he also didn't sit out they ended up taking his fifth year uh, adding uh, uh sending putting him on the franchise tag before they finally signed him it depends what kind of quarter what kind of player what kind of quarterback you're going to get and what their goals are you may you know you may get that uh, uh that type that after two years wants to redo his contract yeah it's really it's weird situation being a quarterback because, I mean, if you play really well, you can get the early extension like a Carson Wentz and a Jared Goff, and not pan out at all. So it's it's really hit or miss. I mean, people you know bash the Cowboys for waiting for so long to sign Dak. I mean, Dak has played better than both of those quarterbacks, and you know they got paid earlier. So I don't know. Um. I called it too. I mean, if you want to go back all those years and go on Facebook and Twitter and, and prove me wrong, uh, you can. But when they started negotiating Patrick Mahomes' contract, I said the Cowboys need to pay Dak now. I think the number was like $32 million a year. It's like, because, you know, Patrick Mahomes is going to reset the market. Uh, and he did. Uh, that's why, I mean, people say they signed Dak Prescott. He was he, He's never been the top paid quarterback uh, ever because. Patrick Mahomes signed before him, and he's still below that. But once Patrick Mahomes signed, uh, that's when the number went up. Dak played, uh, bet on himself, and won. He could have, you know, they could have gotten him for 35, I think at the time, 32 million the year before, the offseason before. Uh, they had to place a franchise tag on him, but um, that's what you have to do. And I, and I think uh, – any team that doesn't have a top five quarterback that's that wants to keep their quarterback and re-sign him, they need to as soon as possible because you have Jalen Hurts is going to need a new contract. You have Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow might reset the market. I think he might get fifty million dollars a year. Um, I mean, you just already saw Daniel Jones is getting forty million dollars. Uh, the longer you wait to sign unless you just don't know if they're your guy. And I think that might've been the thing. I don't know that the Cowboys thought that Dak was going to be their quarterback. 
Um, but if you know we want to sign Dak and, you know, holding out isn't, isn't to your advantage when you're an owner. Only when you're a player, and, unless, the, unless the player just has a terrible season. But then again, you lose. It's a lose-lose because if he has a terrible season, then your team had a terrible season. You know, you, you want your players to do great. But then you want to re-sign them to new contracts before, right before they do great. Uh, but then again, you, you can't always predict that as you did with Carson Wentz looked like he was going to be the next great quarterback. I fully believe he would have won an MVP if he wouldn't have got hurt that year. And honestly, I think he would have been a great quarterback if if his team wouldn't, if Nick Foles wouldn't have led his team to a Super Bowl while he was sitting on the bench injured. Uh, Philly's not a fun place to play. Uh, you have to be mentally strong to play there. And then when you come back after a backup quarterback wins the Super Bowl and you don't play great, uh, it's it's not going to end up well for you at all. So I think it was a mental thing with Carson Wentz and Jared Goff. I don't even know. Uh, he just fell off a cliff. I know last year he did okay for the lions. Uh, it's just a weird situation. But then again, Jared Goff didn't look all that great. His first couple of years, he had so much hype going into the draft that everyone thought, well, he it's going to work out. He's going to pan out. It's just his rookie year. Uh, he's going to improve and he just, he just didn't not as much as yeah. they wanted him to. Yeah. He wasn't too bad. Jared Goff. I mean, he did lead him to the super bowl. I mean, yeah, they lost to Brady and them, but you draft a quarterback to lead you to the super bowl. So, and win it. So we'll yeah, see. Statistically, um, uh, I'd have to go back and look, but from a feel standpoint, how I think and how I remember things, I, I don't think he's had, any years better than Dak. Maybe oh. maybe maybe take out Dak when he got he broke his leg or broke his ankle. Um but I think Jared Goff like every year has been slightly above average. I oh, yeah. I think that uh maybe it was his second second or third year. It's probably that Super Bowl run. Um he probably had a pretty good year. I, I think he probably was an MVP candidate. Yeah, I'm not, but I mean, also it didn't help with Wentz too. You know, like you said, when Nick Foles won the Super Bowl, didn't they build a statue outside the stadium with Nick Foles? Yeah, that's uh, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, for Philly, who who hates everybody, you just come in as a backup quarterback. That's all you had to do, win a Super Bowl. But then again, it's their their only Super Bowl, so uh, I don't know if uh. I mean, it's different in other sports because quarterback's kind of the main player. It's it's hard because the Cowboys have a few Super Bowls, but I mean, I don't know what it takes to build a statue here in Dallas. We have a statue of Nolan Ryan, arguably one of the best pitchers of all time. He only played a few years for the Rangers, and then Dirk, who was maybe the best Dallas sports player, not necessarily talented wise, but just because he's the longevity, he stayed here forever, showed the loyalty. Uh, the best or most liked sports icon in, in Dallas sports history. Uh, but I don't know. I guess if, if your backup quarterback leads you to a Super Bowl, he deserves a, he deserves a statue. That's kind of weird. They, of course, Philly does have a statue of a, of a make, make believe or mythical, whatever you want to call <laughs> it, a, a fake sports icon in Rocky Balboa. So why not? Yeah. As long as it's better than the Washington Redskins and Sean Taylor statue. Statue? Uh statue is a <laughs> is a strong word for that. I thought like footlocker display. Not even a mannequin, just a footlocker display. Is what that that's what you go in and you see how the the uniform looks on, and that's all it is. That was the man. If you I, I don't I don't know that I hate as a Cowboys fan that I hate Washington more than Philly. Uh, maybe it's just because Washington hasn't won anything and Philly's the team that's winning right now. But what a dumpster fire organization right now. Oh, I love watching it burn. Yeah. It's yeah. And I hope see. they don't sell the team. Uh, I, I, I think it would be absolutely, it would be great for Cowboys fans in general and I guess other NFC East teams. Um, 
if the current organization ownership group kept uh, kept the team. I like it. Yes, sir. Um, now I guess we can move. Uh, if we're done with free agency, we can talk about March Madness and how well or terrible your bracket is doing. Yeah, I was just looking at that. I'm sitting awful. Uh, my final, my championship team's still there. I picked Alabama to win it all. They're just super talented. I mean, with all the drama of that, you know, the Darius Miles situation, but that team is just super solid. Um, I'm sure everybody picked Princeton to advance to the Sweet 16. So okay. that was – I mean, uh, um, <laughs> you know those are brackets that, that kids do when they put the mascots and you try to pick the mascots? Uh, or the coolest logo, maybe Princeton made it in some of those. Uh, I did have a friend who actually picked um, Fairleigh Dickinson to win in the first round. They got that wrong, wow. but uh, they didn't do much better on the rest of their bracket. But I thought that was interesting. That's one of those ones they they didn't. They've never watched a Fairleigh Dickinson game. They just thought I'm going to pick this upset. And sometimes yeah, that's what you have it... to do if you pick safe brackets. Uh, you may do pretty well. I know right now I had my all my Elite Eight teams still in until Kansas lost. Um, but I had Houston, Alabama in the, in the finals. So from a standpoint that I'm in a group that I paid money in that uh, I can still win, just, I'm doing pretty good uh, from that perspective. Uh, but yeah, my I, I don't think I've ever done this bad on a bracket. Usually I... The day one, I'm like six, six out of eight in the first, uh, in the first few games. I, I remember one year I was, I went nine for nine until I, uh, until the first team lost. But th- this year it was, I think madness is, is no better fitting a word than it has been this year with how this is turned Oh out. yeah. I love watching like the big upsets. I don't know if you saw on social media about they showed Purdue Stadium and then they showed Fairleigh Dickinson yeah. Stadium. Yeah, that, that's, that's <laughs> it looked like our high school not stadium. Only, not only the upsets because I know when Virginia lost to US UCSB USCB, um, yeah, if you remember, it wasn't even a close game. Virginia lost by like twenty. It's just how these teams are winning. There's been buzzer beaters. There's been close games. Virginia lost on a ridiculous pass that should have never happened when uh, they were trapped in the back court in the corner and they had a timeout and they just threw the ball away. And, and uh, my gosh, there's more uh, pit. I like pit right now. I hope they make a run. Although they play Texas in the next round, if they win, uh, yeah. that, that was a team who was in the first four. They, uh, Watching that Iowa State game, they were up twenty to two on Iowa State, and uh, Iowa State didn't get their next basket till like nine minutes and something in the first half. So they had scored two points in the first ten minutes. Uh, Texas A and M, that wasn't as big of an upset, but that was disappointing. I wanted them to win. I wanted Texas and A and M to play each other. That, that's what I wanted too. I was looking forward to that. Um, obviously, I looks uh, like. Let's see, where is it? Arizona and Princeton. I mean, Princeton, it's not like Fairleigh Dickinson. Obviously, everybody knows about Princeton. Um, even if you, a few years ago, they had won a couple of upsets. They've gotten a couple of upsets in back-to-back years, and they were the giant killers. I don't remember what they were called. Um, Furman. That's yeah, when Arizona went down. Arizona went down. Um, that's when, that's, went that's down. what killed my bracket. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm uh right now for Fairleigh Dickinson just to keep going. Why not? I think it'd be fun. I just hope they don't make the final four. I always want the final four to be powerhouse teams. Every year I, though, there's always this one college that no one even has even heard of. I remember Loyola Chicago. Loyola Chicago with, uh, Wichita State, George Mason. I mean, they're fun stories, but I like them to lose in the. I want the final four. Uh, I have them: Houston, Alabama. I had Kansas. I had Marquette. 
I have Marquette, but you always want your final fours to be Duke, Kentucky, uh, Baylor, Texas. Yeah, they usually have the most talent. Most yeah, that's what you, usually the most of talent you, will come out. People say they want Cinderella stories, and it's fun to talk about Princeton and Fairleigh Dickinson, but nobody wants to see Princeton play Fairleigh Dickinson in the final four. <laughs> No, no, we, we no. want these juggernauts. I want teams to make it to the sweet 16. I want them to make it to the elite eight. But once we get to final four, I want to see great basketball. I want to see heavyweights just going back and forth. Um, last year, Kentucky, um, uh, Kansas, North Carolina was a great game. A few years ago, you had Villanova, North Carolina. Excuse me. You, it's, that's, that's the matchups you want. Nobody wants this. I mean, even and Butler made it all the way to the to the championship game and lost a close one to Duke. But nobody wants them in the final four because you don't want to see a, a 20, 30 point blowout in the final four, which you obviously have a chance to see that when you have a St. Mary's or a Pitt or even Auburn, Colgate. Well, I know Colgate lost Howard. Um, it's a fun storyline, but, but I think at the end of the day, we, we all want to see the powerhouses play. Yeah. I mean, like I, like we we're talking about fair Dickinson is I'm just looking right now. They play at six forty five tonight. That's like primetime television. You got Kentucky playing at one. I mean, fair Dickinson. I think they played the, I think they were like the first game of the tournament. <laughs> so, and they had to have a play in to even get into the tournament. So. I mean, I know Florida Atlantic is doing good this year, um, where they ranked ninth. But I don't want it if it was like Duke Fairly Dickinson. I'm like, okay, let's see it, and I'll probably watch the Fairly Dickinson game. But when they're playing Florida Atlantic, it's like, okay, I think they have a good chance to win. Maybe I mean I haven't watched much Florida. Do you know, obviously Florida a. a Florida, I said Florida International. Did I say Florida A&M? Florida International. Let me make sure before I just. This yeah. is Florida Atlantic. Florida Atlantic. There's too many. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, they obviously have a much better team than Fairleigh Dickinson. They're a better known team. Um, but it's just, it's not the same. I know it's a huge upset if, if they're able to make another win, to win again and go to the, the Sweet 16. But uh it's it kind of cheapens it even though they win they get to play tennessee so uh either way i think that'll be that'll be a fun matchup either tennessee blows them out or they continue their cinderella run oh yeah tennessee is most likely gonna blow them out i mean you can only get lucky on so many calls or you know baskets when it comes down you know to like you said these heavyweights fighting i mean it's just a talent I mean, most of these guys would even, you know, make the team on like a Tennessee or a Kentucky. So most of these kids, you know, they're just they're just getting luck, lucky on some shots. And I mean, and they have to play it. By, by, I mean, their strategies. I mean, fairly Dickinson's coach talked about it when they were playing Purdue. So they have to try weird things. They have to do something different. You can't beat them straight up. Uh, no. And and he's and if you play him ninety nine or a hundred times, they're probably going to beat you ninety nine times. But you just have to to figure out how to win that one time, and that's why it's March Madness. Um, yeah, you don't have it's like in the NBA. More than likely, it, there's not going to be huge upsets because in a seven game series, the better team usually, is, for the most part, is going to win uh, four games before you can. But when you just have one game, it's. Uh, Anything can happen. Yeah. So, uh, so who do you got to win in the championship? I have Houston. Who's on your bracket? Did you uh, say? Yeah, Houston, Alabama is my championship. Like I said, I had Kansas and Marquette in the final four. Um, I'm still kind of worried about Houston. A lot of injury issues. Yeah. Uh, we'll see though. I mean, I, I, last night I know they were. It was a close game at halftime, but they ended up pulling away. Uh, at this point, I know a lot of teams uh, in the group, a lot of guys in the grouping I'm in have Kansas winning it. I know one has TCU winning it. Um, so there's obvious, and then one had uh, 
Arizona winning it. So there's opportunity there for me to move up. So I, you know, I still want my bracket to do well, but uh, I'm fine with, you know, I'm a, I'm a Longhorns fan mostly for football. I'm a Duke basketball fan, but I still feel oh, wow. like Longhorns pretty well in basketball. Yeah. So if it's the next round and it's Texas, Houston, I want Texas to win, you know, but uh, yeah. I'll take, I'll take it. I'll take Houston winning just because it helps my status. Uh, but we have like 40, 40 different people submitting brackets. So, uh, and right now I'm in the middle of the pack. So who, who knows, but I'm not going to say I want Texas to lose just get my outside chance of winning some money because everybody's bracket is shot. Everybody's kind of close in together. And you know, there's people ahead of me that don't have a championship team left. Uh, there's opportunity to move up, but I don't know. I'm kind of in that, that, that window where like, eh, it's okay. If my back bracket's already screwed up, let's just, let's just have Texas winning it all. Or let's have TCU do good. Yeah. It looks like I have I look, Houston. I didn't final even know the four. final four is in Houston. So that, that'd be interesting to have Houston. Oh yeah. In the final four. Yeah. My final four is Alabama. Oh, well, I had Purdue. Uh, Texas and Gonzaga, and then Gonzaga and Alabama in the national championship with Alabama beating Gonzaga. Yeah, that that's not that's not uh that's a pretty strong championship. I, I'd want to say it's a pretty strong Final Four, but Purdue is kind of. <laughs> it yeah, looks, in I don't know. Side, it looks like a bad pick, but uh, people go back and look at their weaknesses and say, "No, that's not a good pick." But nobody was thinking that. Not not very many people were thinking that beforehand. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I feel like Purdue has been a top, a number one seed the past couple, a couple times the past couple of years, and yeah. they were first round exits every time. Uh, I think a couple of years ago it was a. Uh, they made it to the Sweet 16, and they had lost to. I can't remember one of the Cinderella teams. It was a 15 seed that beat Kentucky, St. Peter's, or something like that. But their last three have not all been first round exits, but has been to a 13 seed, a 15 seed, and now a 16 seed. So they have been on the wrong end of a few upsets. St. Peter's, yeah, I think that's the team. St. Peter's was the 15th seed, and the, uh, they beat them in the Sweet 16. And then the year before, they lost in the first round to a 13 seed. That's crazy. It's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. March Madness, though, like you said, it doesn't get any better than that. It's a good time of the year. Spring training with baseball. I mean, I've been watching the World Baseball Classic and March Madness, free agency and NFL. It's a good time for sports right now. It's a great time. And I, and I always say the fall is better when you're getting into October when, when it's baseball playoffs. And all four of the major sports are intertwined. Um, but this, this is definitely uh, – up there in the best times of year, uh, best times of the year. And um, we don't really have time to talk Texas Rangers, but we'll definitely be talking to them as, as they get closer to opening day, because they, you know, they're not a world series contender, but they're, they're working on getting there. They have an outside chance to make the playoffs and made big moves uh, this off season. And uh, just in general, it's great to be a, a, uh, Dallas sports fan with the stars doing great. The Mavericks are kind of in there. The Cowboys making moves, the Rangers making moves. You'll definitely hear that. Uh, coming up here, coming up on the sports page. Um, I know Bo, his show's coming up. So keep a lookout for that. Talking BS with Bo. Uh, sure. And I guess, and for the foreseeable future until his show gets up and running, he'll be here on the sports page with myself uh, and Chris. So, Guys, thank you for listening. We appreciate it. Go ahead and follow us. You see my tag right there, Bo's tag. Follow us at Sports Page Radio and follow the network at Peak One Sports. See y'all guys later.